space, space exploration is underway with a blast off this morning of the first part of what will eventually be a huge international space station. The station will be visible from the Earth, shining brighter than the brightest star. The rocket carrying the first cargo module for the station left the Russian Space Center in Kazakhstan this morning. The station will slowly expand as dozens more modules arrive over the next few years. A moment of history, the launch of the first stage of the International Space Station, on time and up into space without a hitch, paid for by NASA, built and launched by the Russians. And ten minutes later, when it made it into orbit, there was obvious Russian pride. At Mission Control in Moscow, there's relief, there's euphoria. The first stage of the International Space Station is now in orbit. It marks a new phase in the human exploration of space. As well as the Russians, 15 other countries are involved. NASA's head, Dan Goldin, was buoyed up by today's success. Within a few years, the brightest star ever will appear in the sky. It'll be a sign of hope because all these nations are coming together to utilize technology not to blow up humanity but to make this place a better world and to leave Earth orbit and to land on Mars. Once in orbit, the module, known as Zarya or Sunrise, will power and propel the station. In two weeks' time, the shuttle Endeavour will attach a docking module. In all, 100 separate bits will be bolted on, creating a space station the size of a large football field. This will require 45 separate missions and a thousand hours of risky spacewalks. By the year 2000, the first crew will begin scientific experiments, but the ultimate aim is to build bases from which to return to the moon, and then on to other planets. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, at Mission Control in Moscow. And I'm joined now by Meghna Chakrabarti, who's Assistant Curator of Space Technology at the Science Museum. Uh, there's a long way to go, isn't there, before it's up and running? Yeah, there are at least five years before the space station is fully complete and a good two years or a year and a half before we actually have astronauts on board manning the so space what, station. So dozens of missions still to go to, to put to bring stuff to it? Yeah, there are, about, uh, there are a total of 45 missions, so we have at least 44 more to go before the space station um, is fully assembled. But um, about halfway through those 44 missions, we'll actually be able to put astronauts on board. And once it is fully assembled, what, what is its primary purpose? Mm -hmm. Well, its primary purpose is as a permanent facility that's free of gravity. So it's our permanent um, f uh, space station outside of Earth's system. And Mir is an old and sort of ailing technology, which is why we definitely need a newer facility to Why is it take so important, it? though, to have a facility that hasn't got gravity? And what does it enable us to do that we can't do at the moment? Yes. Well, everything, that, every scientific endeavor we undertake here on Earth is influenced by gravity. And so things such as making um, high technology materials are limited by the way the materials act due to the force of gravity. So if we're free of that, we could possibly make, let's say, really pure crystals, really pure proteins, things like that, which are impossible to manufacture on Earth. Briefly, it's an awful lot of money, isn't it? It could have been spent in different ways, perhaps, still in space, but in perhaps an unmanned space manner, which could have actually got us further for our money. Yeah, well, there are always critics for any large-scale um, endeavor into space, but in order to take the next step, as far as, let's say, going to Mars, we definitely need this platform, our space station, in order to get there. Thank you, Chakrabarti. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The latest stage in the Middle East peace process has gone ahead despite a last-minute hitch. Israeli troops handed over the West Bank town of Jenin to Palestinian rule after Yasser Arafat personally ruled that Israeli changes to the agreement were not significant. 250 Palestinian prisoners have been released, but there's anger that most of them are common criminals rather than political prisoners. For two years, there's not been much to celebrate. In Kabatia, the largest town handed over this morning, 17,000 Palestinians said goodbye to the days of Israeli control. It's not the end of occupation, but after a long period of stalemate, it feels like progress. The day began with a handshake, Israeli and Palestinian officers meeting to supervise the first of several handovers planned for the coming weeks. For local Palestinian commanders, this was the first glimpse of the new maps. Inevitably, there was talk of a hitch, Palestinian officials accusing Israel of last-minute changes. 
but this was a day for cooperation. The delay was brief. The two sides got on with the business of drawing the new lines. Concrete posts mark the boundaries separating areas of control. Each location is carefully checked using satellite technology. In this conflict over land, every inch is important. It may not seem like much, the moving of posts and the setting up of signs, but this is the first tangible evidence for almost two years that the peace process is actually moving. Another part of today's deal, the release of 250 Palestinian prisoners. Relief, but disappointment too. The Palestinians wanted political detainees. In the end, all but 100 were common criminals. Palestinians are far from euphoric about today's handover. They know how long it's taken to get here. They know that other battles lie ahead. I am independent now. I am very, very happy. Do you think this is real liberty, real independence? No. This is, this is the step in the, the, uh, in the, in the first step. The first step. The peace process is once more on the move. The question now, will today's sense of momentum last? Paul Adams, BBC News, on the West Bank. A woman jailed for life for murdering her partner is appealing against her conviction about when Britain is likely to enter the single currency and swap the pound for the euro. The government say a decision on Britain's entry won't be taken until after the next election. But a British retail consortium say shops and stores will have to be prepared to accept payment in euros from next year. Retailers have two big dates in their diary. Five weeks to Christmas and six weeks to the start of the euro. British tills are ready to take the new currency. Many shops here will accept euro checks and credit cards from January the 1st. The notes and coins won't be in circulation for some time. Retailers say they want a decision soon from the government over if and when Britain is going to join the single currency. We need certainty before we will have put the money and the investment in. We think that the UK government is being a little bit naughty uh, in asking us to put resources and money behind the preparations for this change to the euro. Britain's last big currency change, decimalisation in 1971, took years to prepare for. And amongst the public, there was some reluctance to give up pounds, shillings and pence. No, I want the old money. What are you going to do when you've got old money? Well, I don't know what I should do. The high street banks began preparing for the euro years ago. The checkbooks are already printed. And from January, they'll be offering euro loans and mortgages. But they realise that there's still a lot of confusion amongst customers. A lot of people don't know very much about the euro. Um, over 50% of customers don't actually know what the currency is called, for example. And where people have uncertainty, a lack of knowledge, then sometimes there's fear. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Barclays Euro Helpline. My name is... Barclays have set up a special centre to deal with euro queries. There are lots of calls coming in, even though Britain isn't one of the countries which begin using the euro in the new year. While the preparations go on, the retailers are appealing to the government to end the uncertainty over the single currency. But the government is adamant there'll be no decision until after the next election. And it says it's working closely with the retailers to ensure that Britain doesn't lose out when the euro comes in. June Kelly, BBC News. Scottish Conservatives have called for a binding commitment from Westminster to the continued existence of the Scottish Parliament. The party, which once opposed devolution, now wants Scotland to be an equal partner within the United Kingdom. Former Cabinet Minister Sir Malcolm Rifkin said his policy review had taken a fresh look at all of its policies. One of the few consolations of the impotence of opposition uh, is to be able to start from uh, scratch and say, what are the priorities for the future? How are we going to address these issues at this moment in time? So we have not been constrained by the past, uh, either our achievements in the past or our disappointments in the past. Military historians say the discovery of a complete First World War tank buried in northern France is a significant find. The machine took part in the Battle of Cambrai, which is regarded as the first tank battle in history. It was abandoned by its crew in the tactically important village of Flesquieres. And experts hope that the discovery might shed new light on that offensive. To the children of the tiny village of Flecky.